Today, we are talking to Lauren Marcus, New York City actress, singer, and writer. She originated the role of Brooke in Be More Chill in 2015 and later made her Broadway debut with the show in 2019. Other select theater credits include Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors, Amy and Company, a featured singer in the Jonathan Larson Project at 54 Below, and Mary in Merrily We Roll Along. Lauren has also made her feature film debut recently in the movie Tick, Tick, Boo, directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Lauren plays regularly around New York City with her 12-person band, most recently completing a residency downtown at Rockwood Music Hall. Up next is work on her one-woman musical, Lauren and the Case of the Missing Hair. Please welcome Lauren Marcus. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Hi. So Lauren, as I was preparing for this interview, I realized I think that we have known each other for about 10 years now, which is wild. That's shocking and also like I really just think of everyone as the age I met them at so yes like if you ask me how old you are I'd be like oh Alex Farr is 23 yeah like honestly I don't even 23 yep exactly you're 20 I'm 23 you're 25 and that's just that okay (laughs) but I'm so excited to chat because as I was going over your professional bio I have so many questions that like you don't get around to talking about after a show or at a party or anything like that the first thing I want to know is when did you know you wanted to become an actress I feel like I have such a typical answer I was I was five and I was like oh this looks fun we saw Les Mis on tour and I was like that, that's it. That's it for me. And I just decided, which is really, I'm always like, that's what an insane way to decide the rest of your life, like a five-year-old. But when you know, it's one of those things where when you know, you know. You know, right? when you know, you know. Yeah. Where? So where was this tour coming through that you saw? I lived in Chicago. So I lived in the suburbs of Chicago. And you know, I always loved listening to music, but I think that's the first thing I can really remember seeing live on a stage. There's a little girl in it. It was like, all the pieces were like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like yes. it was coming together. Yeah. And that was the thing I think that just hit me very hard. And the first time I realized that like technically I could have the option to grow up and do something like that. And I was really lucky. My parents were really really supportive of it that's amazing I feel like we all have that memory of first hearing Les Mis when we were little girls like I definitely like was in the basement with a broom playing the cassette singing Castle on the Cloud well I and here's my question to you like I we love the Cosette but then like did it get deeper like did you start acting out the other roles because that's when it got really (laughs) one like a heart full of love was like a (laughs) one woman show yes oh my god yes yeah (laughs) Absolutely. It was very dramatic. You guys, I was not doing this. I was Ow. full West Side Story Sound of Music. I, oh! Wow. I was full. I was in Nita or Maria every other day. I was memorizing those dances. I was full <laughs> into that. But this is also like why we're all such pieces of work in the best way, because we decided the rest of our lives at like five years old. Yeah, I, pretty yeah. much. It's such a silly thing and it's very beautiful in a lot of ways, but it's very silly. It's very silly. <laughs> okay, so you go to NYU, you go to Steinhardt, and then you stay in the city to pursue everything. So this is something Tina and I talk about a lot, like the hardest or the weirdest side jobs that we've ever had. Because if you're not pursuing a creative job, you you, you know, and having to have another yeah. job, it's something you don't really understand. Yeah. So I want to know what's the hardest, weirdest side well, job. I say like, pick a job. And I've probably had it honestly like or something in the realm so I did all the like traditional ones waitressing hosting a lot of babysitting but my one of one that sticks out really well to me is and this was a two-day job I sold personal massage devices at the Javits Center not vibrators I swear to god it's like those little tens units that have like the electric impulse shock like the stims like the stim yeah you stick on your yes And so I sold those for two days. And my favorite part or weirdest part about that is there was a dental booth next to us. I don't really, maybe it was like a health and wellness. I don't really know. And so I started talking to these dentist guys because they were so silly. And I was like, I, you give it to me, I'll sell it. I don't know how, like I will sell it. And they went, okay, sell this. And they held up like a plaque. They said, we'll offer you a job if you can sell this, like a plaque pick. And there was a girl I was working with 
who specifically had a problem about the plaque on her teeth that she told me an hour earlier and I sold it to her for $10. And then they offered me a job, like truly in their dental wares thing. I didn't end up doing it. I considered it. That is an amazing story. I think I can sell pretty well. I just really hate it. Right. I, I mean, feel the same way. I feel right. the very same way. Like you We've guys, all been there. I, I sold active wear in a display window in a store by doing what? yoga poses. Mm-hmm. Tina, what was the thing that you was at watches where you just sell something in Times Square? Oh one of your God. jobs? Well, I was, I was hoodwinked. I was hoodwinked. I was bamboozled into this. They told me I was going to be a model and oh, I ended up being a, a, a paperer in Times yeah. Square. They tell you lots of things. Don't yeah. They? Yes. And yeah. I was absolutely hoodwinked in they that They tell situation. you lots of things. They tell you lots of things. Once I thought I was applying to be a personal shopper and it like ended with me getting a check from Russia that someone <laughs> wanted me to deposit and I hid it under my mattress and cried because I didn't <laughs> <laughs> like the shit we do. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're in New York, you're selling one dental plaque, um, <laughs> plaque remover I and know. Well, Alex has been telling me about you for years, and I'm like, I, the the elusive, like, Lauren Marcus, I'm so excited to finally meet you. Um, one of the things that, like, stuck out when she was telling me about you is that she said that you went to a conservatory in Scotland. Yes. Can you talk yeah. about that? That Which sounds so I've fascinating. I've never talked about this with you, so really? I'm really That's interested. I know nothing. Cooler. Also, like, Tina, I feel like we've just, like, met. So I know. <laughs> I'm just so silly, maybe, because I'm just, like, used to seeing you. Or, I know. Or, I mean, I, I feel like, very connected with you I already. right in. Um, but here we are. Here we are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay. So I, when I went to school, I got a degree in music, in voice. And I like my voice now, whatever. But I... I feel like the acting was what did me good at school and the thing that I gravitated more towards in like in the genre of musical theater. And so I always had wanted to study just straight acting. So that coincided with, um, okay, so my, my now husband and I had dated for a year and we broke up for like three and a half years, four. And I was like, we were broken up. I was like, I gotta get out of this city. Yes. I gotta leave. I gotta pack my bag <laughs> and leave. And I did. It was it was all these like things together, and just Scotland felt like a faraway place. So it's kind of a random pick. You know, look, if I gotten into Yale, I would have gone to Yale, but like I didn't get into Yale. So like I it, I applied to a bunch of places, and then this one had the right combo of what I was looking to do, and seemed exotic, and was far away, and was a year as opposed to three, which I think. Oh my God. Scary. I'm like, should I go to Scotland? This sounds amazing. <laughs> start over. <laughs> start over. It depends on what you want. Yeah, start over. What's weird is like, and it's gone. I haven't been back, but it was like I did build this other life there, and then just left it. You know, like I still have some friends I talk to, but it was so weird. You spend a year somewhere. Okay, and you mentioned your your husband, and can you yeah. tell us who your husband is? My husband is Joe Iconis. He's a musical theater writer, performer. Yeah, we met like right at the end of my college experience and dated for about a year. It was disastrous. (gasps) Continued to work together the entire time we were broken up and off. And like, I mean, what's so funny is while I was in Scotland, I remember Joe was doing a production of Rewrite at Heart. And I was like, who the hell is playing my part in that show? (laughs) And I was like, who is Alexandra Ferrara? up to like at truly like in scotland on my computer being a creeper like who is this alexandra that like that is so funny because at the same time i was youtubing to learn the music videos of you doing it I think that's so funny. before me I love that. but yeah so that's how I met Joe this partnership at the heart school in good speed doing rewrite with Lauren <laughs> we were both looking each other up little did we know so silly yeah that is actually that. so funny we're both looking each other online and I also then remember coming back to New York and like there's this whole group of people who like I hadn't met I was such a such a bitch uh, <laughs> this whole group, I was like who are they they think they know what the f- like but I- like I would feel the same way like you're kind of territorial and then of course you have like a more complicated relationship with the writer yeah. and it's just you know oh my god I would totally be like who is this woman so silly but as I should just rest assured now like Joe really only likes to work with the best people in the world so like it's turned out okay here we are 10 years later <laughs> here we are 10 years later yeah <laughs> but um Scotland was like wild parts of it were great parts of it were not 
and it was a whole year. It took me two weeks to be able to understand anyone. The program itself had some issues, but it truly was like what you make of the experience. And like, I kind of just went out of my way to do extra things. So I got to do like a show in the Edinburgh Fringe. I got to, I, I did, I took advantage of my time there. And I did end up dating a Scottish guy like that. <laughs> that was interesting. So you have worked with Joe a ton, yeah. but something that's really cool and specific is that you guys made your Broadway debuts together at the same time in the same yeah. show. So you created the role of Broken Bay Marchell and its journey to Broadway was absolutely not how things normally go. No, no. It was a very crazy journey. Can you walk us through a little bit about that? Yeah. So we did this show that Joe had written um, in 2015, like right after we got married, maybe ish, at Two River Theater in New Jersey had done a couple workshops of the show over the last, like two years prior. We went there and we were all kind of like, oh my God, like this is going to be the next big thing. And then it just got like not a good review in the times. And then as so often happens, like died, like that was it. It was really sad. And we did get together about a month after we closed to make a cast album, pretty much to preserve the memory of it. It was kind of like for fun. You know what I mean? No one was like demanding that this album get made except us. <laughs> so that happened it was a beautiful memory probably like two years later I remember I remember getting tagged in like fan art on Instagram and I was like oh wow somebody this is a deep cut somebody I guess is a fan of Be More Chill then the next week it was like six pieces of fan art and then the next week it was like 15 and it was so bizarre it happened like very quickly and all of a sudden the internet knew about this show it was the weirdest thing i i've ever seen so there was this like demand for it and because of that we ended up remounting the show four years later off broadway and then we went to broadway after that wow the internet is a wild place. The wild west. Like anything can anything go, can happen. Anything can happen. And I really do think it's the first and maybe only time that a musical has gone viral or to like in that it streams wise. Like I don't know the n number now, but it was a show that had run for about four weeks in New Jersey four years ago was streaming competitively with Dear Evan Hansen and Hamilton. Like the exact Whoa. same record close, not far behind. And it was like, what now? Like this show, what? And so I I really have never heard of another show doing no. that. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lightning in a bottle thing. I, I feel like you could try, but how do you, you know? I mean, also I'm biased. Okay. Joe is one of my favorite writers in the world. And I just think he writes things that connect so deeply with people. And in this case, young people really mm -hmm. connect. And it's so interesting because that's exactly what the show deserved, but it happened in this completely unexplainable way that just can't be recreated yeah. in this I mean, really non-traditional way. It can't. And it it's nice. You know, you want to believe it's so hard. This business is so hard and it's so subjective. And like a lot of times in theater, it comes down to one person's opinion and what do you do like how do you fight that you you can't and then the internet rallied and fought that and they were like no 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 we like this we like this that's and amazing people, it was so funny though i do remember like people had trouble understanding what was going on like they didn't understand they would think the numbers were made up they didn't understand like what the internet meant you know theater is like a few steps behind everybody else <laughs> Well, these people that have been doing things a certain way for 50 yeah. years couldn't understand that this, there was a different trajectory could exist. Yes. Yes. And I think it like was a little like weird and scary. And I mean, it was for everyone. We didn't really know what we were doing, but it was really very magical because got to make our Broadway debuts together. We had some friends in there as well. We had lots of friends in there. Um, other friends also making their Broadway debuts, like Will Roland, who's been one of my best friends for such a long time was there. It was so silly. It's like, I mean, it seems like the ultimate dream to like get to work and play and make your Broadway debut with your spouse. But was it ever difficult? to be with your spouse all the time and 
the stress? Have, what was that like? You know what's so funny is we have no trouble too much time. Okay, we both like our time apart. That's fine. We know when, when we need to take it. That's great. And where we both leave to work a lot. That's fine. We get into trouble when we don't have enough time together. And what actually happened during Be More Chill is we did not have enough time together. We were around each other. We were working. But when we're working, it's not like we're there hanging out or being a married right. couple. Like we're very used to working together, but I, I like to think we're pretty professional in the room. Like mm-hmm. we, I'm not over there like touching him, you know? Um, yeah. And then once the show opened, it was ships in the night. It was, I would sleep very late because this show for me, cause I feel like I was an old lady masquerading as a teenager. Um, <laughs> I would sleep late. I would spend my, like maybe be up for an hour or two, do warm ups, then go do the show. And I Joe was out doing other things. And then I get home, he'd be tired. Like we just didn't really see each other. And that was hard. That was the hardest part. When you did see each other, could you ever turn it off? Like, did you have to make an effort of like, okay, we have to not talk about this. We have to do something else. It was hard because Yes and no. It, I think we both learned a lot. Like it was hard because so he's the writer, right? He's dealing with all of the business aspects of it that and I was like, please tell me what's going on. And he still says he says no, like I just learned about myself. I never will. So it's like he would know we were closing and he couldn't it would like break his heart to tell me that. And so he's there holding that inside. I'm kind of mad that he wouldn't just tell me. He didn't want to tell me anything was going on behind the scenes. And then I, right, would come from this show and be like, oh, this gossipy thing, like this happened. And it's his show. So maybe he doesn't want to know who was drunk or who, you know what I mean? Not saying anyone was, but like he, maybe he doesn't want to know who's being like a bitch, me or yeah. something. I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's this weird thing where on, in so, on some level it is so fun to talk about and we do love working together but it it, I guess maybe the Broadway part of it put a different stress on all of it in a way that we learned and wasn't so easy being together is never that we just didn't (laughs) ships in the night and then we couldn't turn it off when we had time together Mm -hmm. yeah I so can you talk a little bit about pressures that are on performers in a Broadway show for anyone who just does not know. understand what yeah like the pressure of you know how everything affects you. you get a cold well that affects your voice like to not get sick to not get injured I mean you dealt with an injury and I can't yeah. imagine dealing with an injury and having people in the create you know the producer being like when are you coming back when are you coming back can you just talk about the pressures that are on performers on Broadway and how you dealt with that Yeah, I think everyone handles their own things differently. There's physical pressures and then there's mental pressures. The mental, I think we're all pretty familiar with. It's like, it's just like that, but the same and more. (laughs) Physically, I had never done a run of anything that physically demanding. Like I'm not a dancer, but we move and dance and run around throughout that show. I'm sure to some other dancer, they'd be like, okay. No, but- it wasn't like fuete turns. It was, you weren't like a raquette, but it was like, you did not stop moving and it was no. nonstop choreography the yeah. entire time. Yes. So like I did, I hurt myself off Broadway and I fell and sprained my ankle in the middle of a show, which I never injured myself that way before never had anything like that happen on stage it was very wild i had to be like taken to the hospital mid show oh my god and it was it opened my eyes because also like i'm good vocally i know how to take care of my voice i had never warmed up for a show your body you mean yeah and when that happened that was like the biggest i mean i'm lucky i'm I, sometimes i'm like i wonder if the physical therapists were like it's a sprained ankle calm down but it was like very traumatic at the time and I learned how to get better, how to recover. I learned the importance of warming up every show, which I'm lax on it sometimes, depending on the type of show I'm doing. But for that show, I warmed up every day. I made sure to get eight or nine hours of sleep every day. But like your social life changes. Like you don't have as much. And also if the show's, you know, I'm sure if the show's easier, it's different. But for me, I had to do that. It just had to be about the show. And like my social time came at 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. I go out for a drink probably every night and then I go home. I feel like there's such a misconception about 
people that work on Broadway and like how easy it is like how easy the work schedule is because it's like oh well you can sleep all day and then you just you don't have to work until eight but we all know that that is just yeah. not the case because there's all sorts of other things that you have to do in it, your life during the day funny I can't remember who said this or someone said this in an interview but it's so funny it's like your whole day is wrapped around being in service of being the highlight of someone else's day. You know what I mean? Yes. And that's a really, really beautiful thing, but it does mean you're sacrificing having dinner with your partner for mm -hmm. like, in my case, like for six months, we'd see each other after, but you're sacrificing that, that time of the day when you come home and you relax and it, you know what I mean? And you're, you're giving that to someone else, which is awesome, but it's, it, it's different. Your whole day is in service of like, I got to bang out these errands if I have a few minutes so that I can get there to the theater. What did a typical day when you were like in the throes of it, you're on Broadway, what's a typical day from like waking up to going to bed? What what did yeah. you do? I feel like I'd wake up probably in the tens or maybe around 11. I love to sleep. I have a problem. No, so do we. I we would do anything to be a person who wakes up early. I just was saying to Joe this morning, I was like, I want to do that. How do I do that? He's like, I don't think it's possible for you. But um, <laughs> probably till like 11, then I would have a coffee, chill out, check emails. I didn't have to work out, which was great during the whole run of that show. Anything I had to do, I had a couple hours to do in the beginning of the day. And then honestly, like around three, four, I would just start mentally prepping. I tried to either do a physical warm up at home. Maybe I'd have coffee with a friend or something, but honestly, I just like, to rest or mm -hmm. write like or I would be working on my own stuff that would be the time for that go to the theater around 6 6 37 it was an 11 minute walk from our apartment so oh, I took it out very well dreams. dreams yeah have a coffee do the show go out for a drink rinse repeat and then two show days forget about it you there's no literally you go your whole it's so weird it's like you're locked in a little building it's a dream in so many ways and it's also it's just like intense two show days were intense and i've never done anything a long enough run where you have shows really where you're like i don't know if i can do this like yeah. I, it's or i don't want to but then um i never missed a show on broadway because it took me a very long time to get there and all i could think is how much i would regret after the run if i'd even let one go which mm -hmm. maybe is stupid i might i don't know if i'd do that again but i am very happy with that show I made that decision like it, it is not lost on me in like that I got to do that you were grateful and it's a huge dream and a huge accomplishment but also comes with sacrifices which I yeah. think is interesting for people to hear I want to ask you a little bit about some of your relationship dynamics oh, because yeah. I mean honestly selfishly because I want to know because I also have a husband who's in the same business as Love. me in a different way I want to know really practical things like how do you guys work on budgeting and planning in this business where you never know what's around the corner. You never know what's next. You never know when you have to go out of town. You never know when something is going to close yeah. with all the question marks. How do you kind of like structure your lives? Well, here's something that has been true at every turn of our lives. Joe and I are terrible with money whether we have a nice amount whether we have five dollars it will be like we're terrible and both of us are absolutely insane like we we love going out to dinner like that's such a fun thing for us we joe has said before he's like if i had 20 dollars in my pocket like and that was it to my name he's like i'd spend it i get a nice <laughs> drink and then i figure out what to do the next day i mean i mean you guys are also incredibly <laughs> generous with your money too yeah we do we also like to like i mean joe especially joe is like yeah we are terrible with money but one <laughs> thing we did do is we ended up getting a business manager if i'm honest with you Smart. and people like I remember our lawyer at the time was like what a waste of money like you're going to be paying x amount to this person doing something you could do uh-uh for us oh. it has saved our lives we don't have to worry because if we're going crazy someone is like stop it which has happened they've been like calm it down like you yeah. actually don't have this level of money to spend and like 
bring it back. And I also don't, I don't think we're like frivolous, like, you know, the great Gatsby. We just, we just really enjoy going out and- no, You live in New York yes. City. Well, you live in New York City. In New York City. Yes, yeah. going to dinner and a show, that is hundreds of dollars. Yeah. It doesn't hundreds. mean you're not like in a private plane. You're not like planning lavish exactly. vacations. You're just like yeah. living- Correct your life in a Correct. very expensive city. And like, okay. let me be very clear. Like we did this when we had no money. Like, like this isn't, you know what I mean? Like, this isn't like a lavish, like we just have problems and we can't keep track of it. <laughs> I would say to anybody, no matter how much money you actually have, if, if keeping track of it is a problem for you, it is worth the investment of having someone who knows what they're doing because they will help you. If I had a hundred dollars, I, I would be like, and that was it to my name. I'd be like, I need someone to manage this hundred dollars. <laughs> I know, I know it would be better in three weeks than if I was left to my own devices. I actually just yesterday had a meeting with someone like this. There's this, I, well, I'll talk about it later on the pod once I've actually yeah. gone through it, but yeah, very similar. It's like a business manager. And cause I'm like, I just need someone to come in and be like, oh, you're a freelancer and you don't have yeah. a solid income, but you've got this, that, and the other thing. Here's how you should budget your money. And Alex, and I talk about this all the time as like independent women and who are doing a million things. Like it's okay to ask for help and outsource. So, okay. I mean, I can't tell you, there would be times I would buy a book that was like managing your money, the secrets. And I'd bring it home and start reading it and crying. And I'd be like, I don't understand. Like, I literally don't know what to do. It's just not a skill I have. And I think it's really important identifying that because for me, I kept trying to be this person who took control of it. And like, that is not a skill I possess. And once I identified that, Yes, I love that. Like identify your skills and then outsource for help. Yeah, you talk about support. this a lot too. Is like you have to know what you don't know. Like I, not everyone yeah. can know everything. You have to know the things that you don't know. And then you have to find yeah. someone who knows that and bring them close to you. I wish we had actually gotten someone much sooner because I think people think you need to have money to have someone like that. And like, that's actually not true at all. It's helpful for us when we're so bad with it and we don't know what we're doing. And also like, I just will get bills and I'd be like, I'll let them sit there. Like it's, I'm that person. It's not good. So I'm so actually stressful. kind of relieved to hear you speak on this because I think it's such a, we like don't talk about money and, oh, I know. Talk, and it's a scary thing, but like, it's so common. Cause I'm the same way. I'm the same yeah. way. Well, it's, well, first of all, we had a really interesting interview with a financial advisor, Christine Sarno, oh. and which I would highly recommend for you, but she said, we need to take the stigma out of this. Talk yes. about money with your friends. Talk yeah. about how you're, that you have a business manager. Talk about if someone has a Roth IRA, how they're saving, how they budget, like that should no longer be, oh, it's inappropriate to talk yeah, about money. It yeah. should be, let's talk about how we all manage it and get it out in the open. But also the structure was not set up for us as freelancers who make a different amount of money every month, mm -hmm. who yeah. never know. I will find out about a job two days beforehand sometimes. I And then from that job, maybe I won't get paid for two to three months. It's like, yeah. how do you, but it takes a lot of creativity and problem solving to budget as opposed to people who make a set amount of money every month. Truly God bless people who budget. I think they're geniuses. Like I, I, I think it's, um, I can, I mean, do you, do you guys do that? Like, and is, does Vinny have a mind towards that? We're, we're working on it right now. We're kind of like clean slate, like after the pandemic and we're working on figuring out, okay, what is our new budget look like with Vin's new job and with what I'm doing? Like we're in the process, but I honestly would love to work with someone too. Yeah. And, and Tina, how are you with, I, I like at the beginning of the year, I had like an Excel spreadsheet and I was clocking yeah. every single yeah. thing. I was, it lasted for about three months and then I just completely yeah. put it out. Yeah. I just couldn't do yeah, it. Like so people have good intentions, but like, if it's yes. not, so that's why I'm hiring someone to come in and do it. Help so me. I'm telling yes. you, you will never regret it. And it will, it will help your money grow as opposed to like, yes. it's one of those, it's a huge investment. It's, um, or it's not a huge, it's an investment that will be a huge. Totally worth it. Well, it's speaking of skills that we don't know we have, or that 
things we don't know. Yeah. Um, so Alex tells me we have a lot in common because we both picked up an instrument sort uh, of later on in life. Yes. Like during the pandemic, I was like, I'm going to finally learn how to play the guitar. And uh, now I'm like playing shows with my well, guitar. Well, cut to, she has an amazing solo show that was spent at Green Room 42. Oh, it's going to be cool. at 54 Below soon. And like, she basically taught herself the guitar in the pandemic and it turned into a, a show. Wait. Literally how, because I've been trying to learn the guitar since I was 12, can't get past four chords, can't do bar chords, will never get better at it. I think. Okay, but you play the ukulele, right? Yeah, but it's easy. I mean, <laughs> but Lauren, you did, you, but here's what I love. You guys have this in common. You didn't grow up, I'm a musician. No. Like you grew up as singers and actresses. Mm -hmm. And then you developed into musicians and writers. So it's just super cool. And Lauren, I wanted, I want you to talk about how you moved from singer actress into musician writer, that new phase yeah. of your life. So I, I took piano for eight years growing up, but I sucked. Like I- We are I, the same person. Literally eight years, like, horrible. Did not horrible. know what I was doing. Yes. Yeah. Like I can, I can learn a song, but I need like a month and it yes. goes very slow. And then I memorize it and then I have it and make it look like I know what I'm doing, but- Yes. That's it. Exactly the same. Um, I love that. I'm also so mm -hmm. curious about your show. Uh, so I'd always like dabbled in songwriting privately or in my head. And um, I never really showed it or talked about it a lot. But um, I actually remember when Joe and I were broken up, he was one of the first people like I emailed him and he was like very encouraging. And I was like, well, okay. Well, he thinks these songs are like, okay. I'm sure like half of them were about him. I don't remember. Oh. Um, he in a beautiful way, really pushed me and encouraged me to keep going with it. He argues me on this, but like, I'm not sure I would have kept going if he hadn't have been like, I don't know if it's something about like being a woman or me or where I'm like, it's just not good. Like, it's not good. And like, I, I couldn't get past that. When I learned, one thing that was stopping me is I felt like I wasn't a good enough musician and I didn't have a way to put down what I was hearing in my head. And so, I learned the uke in Scotland and I kind of started for the first time like writing chords to my song. When I was ready like a couple years later to do a show, I started working with some musicians, one of them being Mike Rosengarten, like who I still work with to this day. And I remember being so intimidated when I would share these songs because I felt like musically I didn't know what I was doing. It took me a, about a year to realize I definitely knew what I was doing. And it's like, just because you can do one thing doesn't mean you can do the other. So it's like, just cause you're a great musician doesn't mean you know how the hell to write a song. And like it, 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 many times they have no idea how to write a song. So I, once I kind of realized those were different skills, I got a little bit more conf confident about it, kind of took off. Like it just took some confidence and some, some years of practice and, and getting better, um, which I still think is happening, knock on wood, hopefully. And then what's, so then the singer songwriter thing has been happening probably for like 10 years. I have a band. And so I very much have also tried to stay out of the realm of musical theater writing again, because I think I was so intimidated, like, because I know some of the best writers in existence, but I, the last couple of years have like lent itself to that starting to happen. It's hard because sometimes I try to keep the two worlds separate and I really do like the singer songwriter stuff to be separate. Um, and I was scared to venture into musical theater writing because I was scared people would think of my singer songwriter stuff as theatrical, which just happens when they find out I know I do that I do theater. See, this brings me to a question I have. This is something Tina and I talk about a lot because we yeah. both work in a lot of different areas. Like Tina has her show. She's a makeup artist. You know what I mean? Like we both yeah. do, we have, we do the podcast, like a lot of different areas. How do you structure your day slash your life to give everything the time that it needs? And do you go through what we go through where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm doing one thing. This other thing is slipping. I have to get back yeah. to that. Like, how do you manage that? It's kind of a constant game of that. And then it's like, what fire needs to be put out immediately today? Honestly, <laughs> like, what is the thing that needs my attention the most today? I wish I could say that I sat down, I, I do an hour on this and an hour on this. I don't. I usually just work in chunks. It is starting to be 
it's always been a little scary, but it's starting to be like a little bit scarier recently. The bigger the writing projects, it's like, no, I, I really have to sit down and devote hours to this. And then it's like, I live in fear, even though it's all I want of, of booking something. <laughs> like, and then it's like, what would I even do? So it's just kind of like dealing with the fires. You live in fear of booking something as an actress, what you're saying yeah. when you have all these projects going. all I want. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's like that- the dream, but also I have, now I have nine other dreams. It's, but I do, I live in fear of it, even though I want it very badly. I would I, Lauren, I'm literally going through the same thing. Really? Tina and I have some really oh, yeah. fun things coming up with, the, you know, this and some other projects going. And then as I'm auditioning and I'm looking at those dates, I'm like, oh my God, what if, what, what if? if this and this, and I can't even look at the dates anymore. No. I just have to like, I like, can't even look at it. I'm just yeah, like, so, so- it, the joke of it is it's like i feel like there have been things recently i'm like well i'm gonna get this like and then i'm gonna be out of town for seven months and then i don't get it and then i'm like well why did i even spend time worrying about it like why did i i'm such an asshole like i I (laughs) never got it nobody cared (laughs) and the worry like so i think that's letting go is helpful but like do you guys have schedules for your day or well, like, Alex does. Yeah. Alex is good at scheduling. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, because here's the thing, because I will find out about a self tape or like a vo- I do voiceover jobs from my closet. Those things are commercial stuff. They're all so last minute. Yeah. So last minute, like night before day yeah. of. So for those things, you, I can't control them at all. Yeah. So yeah. I try to get up early and do all of my work for this podcast or anything else I have going on, like early in the morning, that way my day can be availed to whatever email I get. Can you get this tape in? Can you do this voiceover job right now? Can you make it here at this fitting in an hour? Like, because those things happen. So I am an early bird and I try to do work on my personal projects early in the morning. And then, because the day takes me where it takes me during nine to five. Right. I do think I've gotten really good about knowing how long things take me. That is like a skill that I've grown into. The only thing that can be the wild card is when I'm trying to write and it just isn't happening that day, which I'm usually pretty lucky. Like usually if I have an idea, I can make something happen. Like I know I have, uh, I'm gonna say this, I have rehearsal like at one today. I have not looked at the song, (laughs) Um, but I know if I have, 30 to 45 minutes, which I will, I can get a good pass at it. And I'm a good enough sight reader where I can go in and it won't be embarrassing. Like I, I'm good. I'm good at that way. So like, as the things come at me, I, I, I think I'm good. I know how many days I need to make a tape. I know I need two days to write a song, to have something to show to someone that I'm proud of. Are you a Sagittarius? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're a fire sign. You're totally you a fire sign. So am I, I, but you two are way more alike than I am. You two I are a totally lot alike. I don't know what anything means when I'm having my chart read next week, and I'm very excited. When's, When's your birthday? birthday? November 23rd. The 27th. It, am Lauren? I saying, really? Like, wait. Yes. Alex, wait. I'm December 9th. I'm a Sagittarius right. too, but you guys are a Sagittarius in the same way. I am the a one in a different way. way. I'm really? a little more, I'm a little more like type A- then you, yeah. two, you two are a lot alike. <laughs> We're so alike because you're talking about it, like the fire sign in us makes yeah. it so like, like I will wait till the last minute because I know if I just, it takes me 30 minutes to do it. It's I, I and I put out the most important fires first. But yeah. I, I wait until. That's yes. so weird. I've never had anyone identify my sign in general, but like, I didn't really think that was a thing. That's Cause you so- like that fire and you like that and you feel creative and inspired if it's like in that moment and it's hot and it's like present. That's wild. I've never yes. had anyone. And then you, like, I feel like you get off a little bit too. Not you. Yes. Like, like oh, I could do it in 20 I minutes. I do it in 20 minutes. Like, yes. Wow. Yes. That's crazy. Oh my God. You're just I've like, I've never heard that before. Huh. I'm like learning all about my sign too. I, I downloaded that app, the CoStar app, and I'm like reading through it. I'm like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. That's so, that's yeah. so funny. I want to, speaking of, get you out of here to learn your song. So I oh, need yeah, to yeah. get to, Don't so worry. we Don't need worry. to get to Tick Tick Boom because. Yeah. We got a lot of fan questions about Tick Tick Boom you? and your experience, uh huh, mm-hmm. and about how you've been close with Jonathan, with the you were in the Jonathan Larson project. So, can you just talk about all of the that, above? Walk us through it. 
Okay. So what is so funny is like, I discovered rent very late in life, like in high school, everyone had known it in junior high. So for anyone who doesn't know, Jonathan Larson, if you're not a musical theater fan wrote rent, but also a lot of other things. But if you don't know anything about Jonathan Larson, you might know rent. So rent. you probably know rent. And so I remember what's so funny in junior high, I was like, what is this musical theater thing that everyone loves? And I was almost resentful. because I was like, all these people who haven't been in it, who never liked musical theater like this. And I was like very weird and judgy about it, even though I'd never listened to it. So I heard it in high school. I was like, oh God, this is so good. And I obsessed over it. But also what was so funny is I remember telling myself in high school, like my voice is very different than that. I don't really have a place in this canon, which in some ways is like, sometimes you can enjoy something a lot more because you're not obsessing over. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you're out of it. So you don't have to obsess about what part could I play? What could I, whatever. So I always just listened to music that way, enjoyed it. Was like, you're never going to be involved in like rent or something that he's written. Cause he writes like this. Flash forward several years later, I didn't know any of Jonathan Larson's other stuff. And Jen Tepper, a very good friend of ours, producer, she's a musical theater historian, um, had been doing research for two years on all of his other works and putting together this show called The Jonathan Larson Project. And she asked me to be it, be in it. And I was like, of course, secretly in the back of my mind, like, I don't know if this is gonna be like for me. I still, you know, like, I, I don't know what I'm gonna, bring to this turns out the scope of what Batman has written is so above and beyond like the rent stuff like is unbelievable the rock stuff he writes is incredible but he wrote everything he wrote everything like I sang a song that was like 30s inspired I did a big like um talky like patter piece like stuff I just had no idea and talk about the one you sang with Krista Rodriguez because I saw this oh, show it was one of my yeah. favorite the Jonathan Larson project at 54 below is one of my favorite things I've ever seen in my entire life I was fully crying and fully realizing how ahead of his time he was especially with how he wrote for women if you just make a little bit about the song with Krista yeah we sang the song called white male world that like when you think about it he must have written it early 90s and it's basically a song just talking about how uh how it's a white male world and how it's really awful and he also he was a straight white male it's wild that he was able at that time there were not other people saying these things he's saying the things we are saying now as a society in the early 90s which honestly wasn't happening like especially in musical theater it's very political he has lots of songs about uh like environmental uh, he, environmental protest songs yeah the the breadth of his work he's so young truly truly astounding um, but, but yeah, that was truly one of the most, I don't even like this word, but like magical things I have ever done in my life. And I'd never heard any of the pieces before. We did a run of that over like a weekend, I think. And then we made an album, which was incredible. And then um, Tick, Tick, Boom was going to happen, the film. And I saw a breakdown for this part named Vicky who Vicki Lee Hoffman was one of Jonathan's like very, very best friends, collaborators, producers. And I gotten the chance to meet her. And I was like, well, I know this woman. I know exactly what she did. I feel very like connected to the Jonathan Larson oeuvre as of like the last few years. And I was like, I, I think this could be something that I could do. And I actually reached out to one of the producers because I had met her during Jonathan Larson and asked to audition. And then there you go. The premiere in New York is on Monday. I have seen a working version of it. So that was wild. I'm like, I have a small part. Like, no, I have a name. Vicky got changed to Donna. So my name's Donna. I'm like the girl who, whenever they needed a girl, they're like, where's that? Where's that blonde girl? Like, bring her in. Perfect. I, I feel like I have like one line, a couple of my lines got cut, but like, I'm always sort of there. It almost makes no sense, but I'm very proud of it. <laughs> So it was directed by Lynn manuel Miranda. And yes. by the time this podcast comes out, it will be out on Netflix as well. So yeah, everyone is, should watch it on Netflix. Vicki Lee Cock Hoffman. She was such a giant part of his life. Like I always kind of say she was like the Jen, Te like the way Jen Tepper is to Joe. That's what she, I feel like she was to Jonathan. And she speaks of him with so much love and she's so gracious, as was his entire family, um, sharing things about, about Jonathan 
with us. It's like an honor I get to, uh, I guess, like portray her in the movie. You'll see. I think it's so cool you've been involved for so long because don't you feel like if Jonathan Larson were alive now or if we were alive then, like we all would have yep. been it, like something yep. connected. He's so, he At like night. he and Joe would have been like best it's, friends. Like it, it's so never, similar. And everyone kept saying like, if he'd known Joe, he would have lost his mind. And like, I've never seen Joe in the state he was. He came to every show. He couldn't make it to one and he was gutted. He sat there like a fanboy lip syncing to the songs as he learned them and hysterically cried every night. And I think like he never, he feels, I think he feels very close to him as a writer. And it's really, really weird. Some of the things that they have in common, like the, one of the songs I sang was called Hosing the Furniture. And it's this like 10 minute song about a housewife having a breakdown. It's like very sexual. It has like, and it has to do with like um, being a woman and trapped. And like Joe has a song called Ammonia. He'd never heard Hosing the Furniture. That is like a 10 minute song about a housewife trapped. It's like, uncanny how how similar a lot of their things are it's wild okay I need to ask you this because I need for advice for our listeners yes. okay you are the epitome of a self-starter hustler whatever term anyone wants to use you but. don't well okay but like I you it's really inspiring because you don't wait for anyone's permission you just say well I'm doing this thing yeah so can you give us some advice for anyone listening who is afraid to start something afraid to start a project, afraid to try something new yeah. because, you know, you grow up and you go through school and you think someone might knock on your door and say, Hey, will you please do this? And in reality, no one cares. You just yeah, have I'm to, you are literally like trained. If you're majoring in acting, like you are trained to believe that is the only way that something can happen. Exactly. And, uh, when really it's like, you are the leader of your own life. You need to, to yeah. just go. So can you give us some advice for yeah. anyone who's afraid to start to try different I feel like the further along like you get I think you get more comfortable with self-starting the more you do it but one thing that always helps me is I think like if you it sounds so simple but if you don't do it it's not going to get done mm -hmm. if you don't do it it will not happen so like I had dreams of singing on stage with a band and at some point I was like if I don't book a show even if it's just me and a guitar, it literally will not happen. And I, I, it's like, that is something like the fear of regret is something that fuels me hugely the older I get. And it's like, I kind of just think about things like I know myself and I know if I get to the end, I will so much more regret that I didn't try something than if I had tried and failed. I will also say like self-starting is it's hard a lot of ways because it's hard mentally, emotionally. It's also really hard, I think, because you are putting yourself out on a limb saying that I think this deserves attention and space in the world. And it feels like a very selfish thing. Think about anybody who's made art or done something that you like. They had to believe in it and they had to do the same thing. And odds are, it's like, if you feel good enough about the thing you are putting out there if you believe in it it will connect with someone it's hard because I, I guess it's like you it, the fear of rejection or how people are going to perceive you is really really scary the, yeah the fear of regret that's what does it for me it's really a vulnerable position to put yourself in I, I really do think as women especially in the industry we're made to feel so small and that we have to be small to fit into certain boxes yeah. and fit into certain roles yeah. and when you take up something and make it your own and you're a self-starter and you make your own thing that takes up a lot more space than people are used to and it's yeah. really fucking scary it's scary and I think it's also it's like if anyone has an adverse reaction to it I've been thinking about this a lot lately it's like well that honestly that's probably a reflection on them like yeah. if they're seeing someone post about a bunch of shit it's them being probably like oh I wish I could and then it's like whenever I get annoyed by something it's very clearly related to me being jealous or yes or, or relating it to my own like I I do really see that but like I, I think that but that's that like going back to what you were saying earlier. It's like something that you learn with time. Like nobody can tell you this. Like nobody no. can teach you this. It's something that no. you have to. Yeah. Experience. And I, I also think like what is hard is like, and this, this part of it sucks a little bit. Like, I'm not going to lie. When you start, it's not going to be 
the best. It's not going to be what it is five years later. And that is a horrific thing to, to think about, but you have to go through it. You And have- that's also so good to hear because I mean, I know for me, that very thing is what stopped me from doing a lot of things in my early twenties. Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, I, that I was so afraid of that first pancake, that first time out yeah. being shitty that yeah. I just avoid that. I just didn't, I was like, I'm just going to stay in my lane because I was yeah. too nervous about like the first few times around that weren't going to be great. And, but there's no way, there's no way to there's, get around it. There's no way to get around it. And that doesn't mean it's not good. It just, that actually is kind of the scariest thing for me now too. Whenever I want to do something new, I'm always so nervous. And it's almost because it's like, I can look back at, especially like the writing and look at what I was writing like 10 or 12 years ago and be like, Ooh. <laughs> but it's also comforting. Like people get better. You're going to regret it so much more if you never try. It's You're gonna. so true. Mm-hmm. Speaking of putting new things out into the world, you yeah. have a one woman musical. I You're do. about, we are starting, well, you've been working on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So it's called Lauren in the Case of the Missing Hair. And I'm doing a 29 hour reading of it in January through Two River Theater, who who did Be More Chill originally. It's like an original musical. It's all uh, book music lyrics by me. And it's about all of my hair falling out four years ago, which um, when I was 31, I was diagnosed with alopecia out of the blue and all my hair fell out. And it was, ah, uh, oh, wow. It, um, so this is kind of the story of that entire time through now. I don't know. I got, I got to do rewrites. It was through a couple years ago. So now. Oh my God. That's amazing. And you wrote your own musical. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look at you. <laughs> Maybe let's say I like it. I, and also like, it was, it was kind of the one thing it was like, even in the middle of it happening, I still had this vision of a show that kind of was like, I, I like truly during the worst of it, I was like, I could see this on stage. I, like, it was really weird that I had like a mind's eye towards that. And also kind of kept me be like, well, there's something good to come out of it. Lauren, I can't wait to see it because I think oh, I that know. and hear more about it because I think it's very timely. I think with, you know, we're really examining our country's standard of beauty with yeah. body size, skin color, everything. And for you to explore a journey of being in a business that is, mostly related to what you look like and have your appearance change so drastically, I think is really fascinating to explore. And I'm also just really proud of you for how you navigated through it and you're turning it into art that I feel like will help someone. I really, really hope so. Like I, Ooh, I say I very honest in it, which is like also very scary um like I think I'm pretty much an open book on most things but like I did some weird shit to try to get it back or like to try to like normalize myself during the situation and so I I I hope people will be able to relate to it like I I don't think everyone's had all their hair fall out but I'm sure most people have gone through something odd in their lives and Mm -hmm. I I feel like that's an easy connection it's just I feel like it's about also having empathy for people in situations that you don't understand, which was one of the biggest things that I learned through that entire time. Like you just cannot know what someone is dealing with. You can't, and you, you're not allowed really to have an opinion on it <laughs> like, unless, right. unless you specifically dealt with it. Cause that has been kind of the craziest part of all of it, how people feel I should feel about it. Mm -hmm. And you're such a good example of this because I remember that you show up places looking gorgeous, having just performed somewhere you're on Broadway. I mean, all of these boxes, check, 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 husband, married, look like looking like you have a dream life, but no one is with you all day in your apartment alone, knowing what you are dealing with that they don't see I'm more used to it like every year gets a little bit better and brings its own challenges but like and I could talk about alopecia for hours but it's like what's weird is all my hair grows back once a year and it's it falls out once a year so right now I'm going through the fallout phase like five minutes before I was getting on this podcast it's like I have a handful of hair in my hand like which used to would have like turned me to tears and I would have had mm-hmm. to cancel 
podcast. And now it's like, oh, my heart just goes like that. And then I like put on a wig and then it's like, oh, are the seams showing? It's just like, it's so funny. It's all these things people don't think And about. I would have never even known you were wearing wig. This whole time I'm like, God, her hair is so cute. Should I cut my uh, hair off? I'm going to get bangs. This what, looks so good. I love bangs. What's crazy is my hair actually looked pretty much exactly like this when it fell out, maybe a little bit blonder, but it took me a while to get back to having the similar look. And also it took me forever to find a wig, to feel okay in a wig and to find a wig that I like. That was, yeah, it's hard. And also it's like, people aren't seeing the parts of the day when I don't look like this, which is probably the majority of the day. Like I, my, my new thing now is I'm very jealous of people who wake up looking what, like what they look like for the rest of the day. That's, that's, that's like, the who month. is that? Who is that? That's a good, that's a good point. That's a good, who is that? Who is I, that? Cause I, I am jealous of them too, but like who? <laughs> I don't know. People, my husband. Oh, well, men don't count. Guys. You're actually, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Before we let you go and learn your music, we have just a few little rapid fire fun questions yeah. for you. Number one, are there two beauty products that you absolutely can't live without? And will you tell us them? I only started using moisturizer during Be More Chill actually two years ago. I didn't know you were supposed to. I didn't know whatever. I don't know if it's because I've started using it that I like feel it when I have it, but I use this brand called Biosance. Yeah, I love yes. that. It's like the only makeup thing, honestly, that I use that isn't like from the drugstore, more or less. And like, I've tried to switch in other moisturizers. There's always a problem. Like it's the only one I tried to find cheaper ones, but it's awesome. I love it. I love Biosense. You know, they're clean. They're a clean brand. That's why for some reason I went with them. I don't know why, but I was like, this is the one. And I tried, I was like, this is amazing. I love it. I love it. And then also I love, oh, I brought it because I was like, I know I'm going to forget. It's just Revlon Colorstay liquid liner. No matter how hard I try, cannot find a better black liner that stays on. This is about, this is about as good as it gets for me. And for me, I, I love um, a cat eye, so I love, I've also been admiring your liquid liner today oh, too. Yeah, I'm like, sometimes it looks that. Good and sometimes it looks like a goddamn mess, but like, I love, I love that brand specifically that way that brushes. It's the only yes. one that works. I mean, liquid liner has kind of been your signature. You've always been a liquid liner gal, a cat eye gal. It's just kind of your thing and it works am, so well on you. I love it. I am sort of like, do I need to like stop it soon? Do I need to like no. go up? Do I need to be a little more sophisticated? I don't know, but I I just love it. I love it. What's uh, your favorite cocktail? Oh, it's a tie. So it's either gonna be a Dirty Tito's uh, martini. And my other new favorite cocktail that started during um, the pandemic, it's an old man's cocktail. It's called The Godfather. And the way I make it is I discovered Di Serono, the almond liqueur. Oh and my so God. I yes. it and Di Serono, and it is like, I love it. It's so sweet. It's probably like a little dessert, but I love it. Who is a woman that inspires you that we should all know about and follow? Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I love her so much. Wait, wait, wait. Much. Say it one more time. Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Okay. Saying, right, yes. right. She, so she, um, Fleabag, mm -hmm. she's the writer, creator, actress of that. And I, I've actually done a lot of research in my like one woman show. And I love it because she's very much the epitome of what we're talking about. Like she'd never written a show. Someone's like, you should do this. She's like, I really don't think I should. And then she did, you know, maybe it was a also, huge success. Yeah. Maybe she's also the exception to the rule where like first time out, it turns out it's great. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. Know. but um, I, I really look up to her a lot. I think she is just a badass uh, woman who has taken the industry by storm. So where can we find you? Where can we follow you? And where can we find your music? You can follow me. Instagram is where I do the best job. Uh, Laur, L-A-U-R Marcus on Instagram. My website is laurenmarcus.com. It's almost fully up to date. And my music, I would go to YouTube. I am working on, oh God, I start working on an album in like a week. So hopefully I will have some new music out soon. I have some stuff on Spotify. It's like a little older, like be kind, but- um, But that's some of my favorites. The stuff that's I on love, Spotify. Like, I got the one that got away back. Like I will stand behind until the day that I die. You're so cool. You're such an inspiration. That's really sweet. Thank you. Lauren, thanks for being here. This was so much fun. Thank you for having me. This is so fun just to talk.